Any substance that is foreign to the body and has the ability to induce an immune response is known as antigen. An antigen may be a bacteria, a virus, a fungus, or a pollen grain. The ability of an antigen to induce a humoral or cell-mediated immune response is known as immunogenicity. Therefore, an antigen is more appropriately called an immunogen. In contrast, the ability of an antigen only to combine specifically with the final products of the immune responses such as antibodies is called antigenicity. These antigens are called incomplete antigens or haptans. Haptans cannot induce an immune response. However, if they are coupled with a carrier molecule, they become immunogenic. A very good example is the original pregnancy test kit that utilizes anti-HCG antibodies. HCG hormone is a haptan, and it has to be conjugated with carrier molecules such as BSA to get anti-HCG antibodies. In order to induce an immune response, a molecule must be recognized as foreign or non-self by the host. The immunogenicity of an antigen increases with an increase in the degree of foreignness. Generally, the greater the phylogenetic gap between two species, the greater will be the immune response. For example, bovine serum albumin or BSA, isolated from a calf is not immunogenic when injected into a cow. But, when it is injected into a rabbit, it shows strong immunogenicity. However, there are some exceptions. For example, some self-components of human beings such as sperm protein, induce an immune response when injected into the same host. Generally, substances with a molecular mass less than 5,000 to 10,000 Daltons are poor immunogens. In contrast, the molecules with more than 1 lakh Daltons show strong immunogenicity. Molecules must be complex and heterogeneous in composition in order to be immunogenic. For example, homopolymers composed of polymers of a single type of amino acid, or monosaccharides are less immunogenic. On the other hand, heteropolymers are considered to be more immunogenic. Generally, Proteins are the most potent immunogens with carbohydrates ranking second. In contrast, lipids and nucleic acids generally do not act as antigens, unless they are combined with proteins or carbohydrates. For the development of both humoral and cell-mediated immune responses, an antigen must be processed and presented together with MHC molecules, which will be interacted with T cells macromolecules that cannot be degraded and presented with MHC molecules are poor immunogens. An example is, polymers of L-amino acids are more immunogenic than polymers of D-amino acids. This is because, degradative enzymes within antigen-presenting cells can degrade only proteins containing L-amino acids, and subsequently present them through MHC molecules. However, these enzymes cannot degrade polymers of D-amino acids and therefore they cannot be presented on antigen-presenting cells. Even if an antigen has properties that contribute to immunogenicity, its ability to induce an immune response will depend on certain properties of the biological system, or host, that the antigen encounters. The genotype, or genetic constitution of an immunized host influences the type and degree of the immune response. For example, in a study, two different strains of mice were immunized with a synthetic immunogen. One strain produced a high immune response, while another strain produced a low immune response. When they were crossed, the F1 generation showed an intermediate immune response. The immune response of an animal is influenced and controlled by genes that encode B-cell and T-cell receptors, and by genes that encode various proteins involved in immune regulatory mechanisms. The dose of antigen determines the amount of antibody produced in the immunized host. An insufficient dose of antigen will not stimulate immune response, as it fails to activate enough T and B lymphocytes. Conversely, an excessively high dose may also fail to induce immune response. For example, a 0.5 mg dose of antigen fails to induce an immune response in mice, whereas, a thousandfold lower dose of the same antigen, induces a humoral antibody response. 
further, rather than a single dose, repeated administration of immunogens, commonly known as booster doses, at regular intervals induces a strong immune response. These booster doses allow the activation of T cells and B cells for a long time, and antibodies are produced in greater amounts. And, this is the principle behind, booster doses of vaccination. The administration route also strongly influences which immune organs and cell populations will be involved in the response. The immunogens are generally administered parenterally, that is, by routes other than the digestive tract. The subcutaneous route is frequently used for the administration of immunogens, as it moves first to the local lymph nodes, and activates T cells and B cells. However, intravenous administration is preferred for soluble antigens without any adjuvant. Adjuvants are substances that, when mixed with an antigen and injected with it, enhance the immunogenicity of that antigen. The best example is, aluminum potassium sulfate, or alum, which prolongs the persistence of antigens. When an antigen is mixed with alum, it causes the precipitation of antigen. When this alum precipitate is injected into a mouse, it results in a slower release of antigen from the injection site so that, the effective time of exposure to the antigen increases from a few days without the adjuvant, to several weeks with the adjuvant. The alum precipitate also increases the size of the antigen, thus increasing the likelihood of phagocytosis. Another example is, water and oil adjuvant such as Freund's incomplete adjuvant. It disperses the oil into small droplets surrounding the antigen. As a result, the antigen is very slowly released from the site of injection. Freund's complete adjuvant contains, heat-killed mycobacteria as an additional ingredient. The mycobacterial cell wall component activates macrophages, leading to increased antigen presentation potential.